We are in this message series called Conversation Peace. In, in all of our messages, we pull out a conversation piece. So the conversation piece today is this ladder. I don't know about you. Anytime I see a ladder set up, I'm wondering what's going on. Like, what needs to be fixed? Who's getting on it? Are they safe on it? All these questions go through my mind. And I wonder that because I'm a person that really is hesitant to grab a ladder. Like, I'm going to do this. You know what I mean? I'm going to reach. I'm going to jump. I'm going to grab a chair before I grab a ladder. I'm going to scale a counter. I'm going to do anything I got to do before I bust this bad boy out because this is probably the most steps away from where I'm at in the current moment, and I can be lazy. Now, the reality is, is there are things that I want to do in life that require a ladder. Have to have it. Can't get it done without it. And, and I hope today that we connect the dots that conversation peace is actually one of those things. Conversation peace is something that in and of myself, I probably am not wired to get there. But with the help of God, like we can be peaceful in our conversations. And, and that's what we want to be. Like that's why we're doing this message series is to encourage each other as we go into 2024 to, to aim, to have a desire. Like where I, when I go to work, I'm going to change the tone with my words. When I go to class, I'm going to change the words with my tone. When I go to church, when, when, when I go to uh, my team, I, I don't want to add to tension. I, I want to bring peace. See, Jesus talked about that. We have a memory verse for conversation piece. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. It's a wicked, famous statement that Jesus said. It's going to be on the screens. I would love to read it together out loud. It goes like this. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So there is this component to peace that helps people connect the dots that, that that is divine, that that's not necessarily us accomplishing, that there is someone helping us be peaceful and promoting peace and being a person of peace in the places that we go. And we're children of God, like God's children. This is our identity piece. This is what the scriptures say about who we are. And, and sometimes I, I lose that. Like sometimes I just, it just escapes me. But other times, I, other times I am reminded, like, okay, I, I get to promote peace and, and you get to promote peace. So I love this idea that we get to have conversation peace. Now, you might be like, Mike, you don't know what I'm dealing with. Like you don't know my school. And you don't know my job. And maybe, unfortunately, bro, you don't, you don't know my home. You don't know my family dynamics right now. Like, like, peace is impossible. We're not getting there. You can do this all year, and we're not going to get there. And, and I get it, like, because life can feel like that. But here is this, but we're talking about God and what God can do versus what I can do. Back in the beginning of the Bible, uh, the language was written in, this, uh, in Hebrew. And Hebrew has a word called shalom that we translate peace. And, and, and it's just a little richer than our peace. Shalom, if I said shalom to you, people still greet each other and depart by saying shalom. And it's like, I want the very best for you. I want wholeness. I want blessing. I want protection. I want tranquility. I want these things in your life. So I either greet you or depart with, with shalom. The beauty of shalom is that it's, it's common in shalom to take a moment or a situation that's found in pieces, broken, wrecked, and then God comes in and he takes the pieces and he brings them together in peace. And, and maybe you've sensed that. Maybe you felt that in your heart, like my heart was broken and God brought peace. Maybe you felt that relationally, like it was broken and God brought peace. Maybe you felt that in your relationship with God, that sin had me separated, but God found my brokenness and brought peace. So we're a proponent in, in just cheering on, like if God is good at anything, he's good at bringing peace to things that are broken. And so I'm so glad we get to look at this together. So 
We're going to look at a New Testament letter. It's the letter of James. We're going to see instruction that, that leads us towards peace. And, and, and James is, is, he's calling us to something higher. He's challenging the way people lived. He encouraged them to kind of almost do the hard thing. I'm tempted to want to do the easy thing like all the time. And, and that's not my best life. So, so James in this, he's like, hey, church, we, we want to step up. And we get to explore that today. So there is an idea of stepping up that we're going to see. And we find it in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. It reads like this. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. We can just go home. Like this, like it, it, it is a wrap. Like this, I will have to focus so hard to just nail this. All right, so I'm being encouraged or challenged, hopefully inspired to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Let's do it in steps. Let's look at step one, quick to listen. Okay. Listening's not easy, especially when I think you're wrong. <laughs> right? You don't want to listen to me if you think I'm wrong, right? This, this is just how listening goes. Listening is challenging. So just to go from here to here, I got my hands full. You likely have your hands full. Quick to listen. Quick to listen means, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this posture where I want to hear your heart. Everyone is speaking for a reason. Again, I might not like it. I might not agree with it. I might, I might think a million things about it, but everyone is speaking for a reason. And how can I train my life to be quick to listen? I think one way is to recognize that God is quick to listen to me and I am often saying things to him that are crazy, that are wrong, like that I want and he doesn't want. I'm like, God, you're not good at being God. Let me be God for one minute and I'll fix this. And he's like, I'll listen to you but you're so wrong. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is him. He's quick to listen. He's quick to hear my heart. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to, but he does because that's a loving thing. Listening is so loving. Listening is, is so humanizing. If, if I can't listen, it's the opposite. It's dehumanizing. It's, it's like, no, you don't have the right to speak. You don't have the right to be heard. And, and that is not God's posture towards me. I don't want it to be my posture towards others. I know it can be. But this quick to listen thing, like I, I want to try hard to be like, all right, God, help me make that happen. So we have quick to listen. Uh, then we have slow to speak, which is kind of interacted. In, I mean, so connected with that, because if I am quick to speak, that means I'm slow to listen. And again, people are speaking for a reason. I'm speaking for a reason. So often when I start to speak, it means someone else can't. Unless we're just talking over each other and no one's listening at it all, but that's not what anyone wants. So holding words, I have words, you have words. Often when we're listening, we're already kind of thinking about how we're going to respond to what we heard. So there comes a time, whether it's 20% in, 30 40 50% into the conversation, that we kind of stop listening and we're just crafting our, our reply. And I would like to go slower with that. It's going to take longer. It's going to be harder. It might even be annoying for the other person, but it might not. It might be appreciated by the other person. But, but this idea of, okay, are you... Have you said everything you want to say? Uh, do you feel done? Like, I don't want to cut you off. Like, even just saying that, I do not want to cut you off. I, I really care about what you're saying. That can be so healing and so disarming. And often, what I've experienced, and maybe you have, I, I start out hot, 
because I'm hurt or I'm angry or I'm confused or I'm scared or I'm all of these things. And in, in my language, I'm not speaking the way I want to speak, but someone gives me space to speak and they don't even have to speak because I've worked it all out in my head and finally I've articulated or healed or something's happened in my heart where they don't have to say anything. Like God stepped in and he brought peace where there was broken pieces. So quick to listen, step one. Uh, slow to speak, step, step two. Slow to become angry. Some of us are wired where anger is our most accessible emotion. We don't have to try at all. We, maybe we've got to try to be compassionate. Maybe we've got to try to be sympathetic. But angry, we can get there fast. Everyone's wired differently. And honestly, there's all events in life that lead to having that kind of reaction. If anger is our most natural reaction, that's happened for a reason. And we might think that will never change. But we're talking about a God who brings peace. And, and when we experience the peace of God in the depths of our soul, we do change. Like, I, I mean it, our reactions, our interactions, it does change. And, and that's what God wants to do in our lives. Now, now, this is extremely challenging to try to live this out. I don't even want to preach it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm like, get me out of here. Because I got to at least make, like, because it's hard. It's hard for everyone I know. But the reason James is instructing the people to do this is he says, listen, when, we're, uh, when, I'm, when I'm slow to listen, quick to speak, quick to become angry, that's not bringing about the righteous life that God desires. Meaning when I'm angry, when I'm irritated, when I'm worked up, when everybody knows it, people aren't seeing love and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and, and, and goodness, and beauty, and harmony, and shalom, and wholeness. They're not seeing that. They're seeing anger, and we see anger everywhere. Like what we get to contribute to our place is peace. So I want it. I want to fight for it. I want to fight for it with you. The other thing I know is, or the other thing that I'm experiencing is that when I am slow to, when I'm quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, we see things differently. We see people differently. I can actually see you better from here than I can from down there. When I stand down there, I can see six rows deep. The lights hit my eyes. I can't see the back of the room. What I see from here is every one of you. And here's what I want to see when I see every one of you. I want to see someone created and dear to your creator. Someone loved, someone cherished, someone pursued, someone that God designed and delights in. I, when, when we live this out, we see people differently. When I'm always angry, I'm not seeing you like that. So that's the Why? Right? Why are we trying to do this? The, the why is because you mean so much to God. And the people we work with mean so much to God. And the people we live with mean so much to God. And the people we live near mean so much to God. That's the why. So James is calling us to step up. And then when, when, when we're doing this, then there's an invitation to step back down because this vantage point of, all right, God, your ways are higher than my ways. You saying not to be angry when I want to be angry, God, I'm trusting that that is good. And, and we step down humbly, believing that God's word is good for us. And then we find James 1, 21. It says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth in the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, that's what God is trying to do. He's trying to free us and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So another passage that we could just park in and and just be in this entire time. But in summary, James is like, hey, there's moral filth, there's pollution, and then there's beauty in Jesus. And all of these things are coming at us every minute of every day. Every voice, every opinion, every comment is trying to plant into our souls as a seed. And if we let pollution plant, which we do, if, if we let, what's the other word? Uh, evil plant, which we do, I, I promise what's gonna come out is anger, is animosity, is arrogance and prejudice and sexism and racism and all of these things. That is going to produce that. But there's a seed planted in us, the word of God, Jesus planted through our ears, through our soul, in our heart, that Jesus lived and died for us. That he is God and he is perfect. And I really struggle to be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. And because of that, I need a savior. Because of that, I'm not perfect. I am sinful And Jesus is sinless. And Jesus, in his perfection and in his sinlessness, he lived and he died. He was buried. He was resurrected. And in that, he offers eternal life to anyone who is like, Jesus, like, I I want that. Like, Jesus, I I need that because I know me and I feel pieces. And I would love to feel your peace. So so Jesus is coming in our, our lives every single day. We're hearing of his love. We're hearing of his grace. We're, we're hearing of instruction. And then every day we get to try to put into practice these instructions that we're getting. And day to day it differs. Some days were awesome. Some days were awful. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a perfect science but here's what we're not gonna do. Like we're not gonna hear the word of God and be like, I'm just gonna do whatever I want. I'm just gonna do me. Like, yeah, like I'm I'm just, no, that's, that's hearing the word and not putting it into practice. There's an imagery here of someone that looks at himself or herself in the mirror and they see themselves. And when they leave the mirror, they forget themselves. I wish I could tell you I didn't look in the mirror as much as I do. Really like the mirror. Look, at, even I, like, sometimes I treat that as a mirror. Just look at the screen and see. So, so I, got, I got an issue, right? But if I'm in the mirror, I, well, okay. If I'm in the mirror and I'm spinached up, you know what I mean? I don't want to leave without flossing, brushing, cut, like taking care of this. I got a booger, you know what I mean? It's just there, and I'm just gonna be okay with it? Like, I'm not, I'm not gonna be okay with it. Here's my commitment to you. If you have spinach or booger, I got you, right? I will be the person in your life just be like this. Like, if I do this to you, that's the code that you just gotta wipe it away. I always thought this meant that. I always thought I was seeing something in the mirror that, that I didn't like or God didn't like. And I saw it and I was like, it's cool. And I walked away and I just lived with it. I don't think that's this. I think when I look in the mirror, I see myself and I'm a child of God. And when you look in the mirror, you see yourself and you are a child of God, like perfect because of Jesus, loved and pursued, cherished, wanted, desired, peacemaker. That's who we are. 
And, and, I, and I think the complication comes when I'm in the mirror and I'm like, all right, I'm loved by God. And I leave and I forget that I'm loved by God. And I forget that I'm a peacemaker and I'm fighting and I'm arguing and I'm battling and I'm angry and I'm irritated and I'm insulted and I'm all of these things where when I keep my identity intact, I don't have to worry about that stuff as much. Like Jesus is the epitome of you can't insult him. He's God. He's walking on earth. People are like, he's crazy. He's broke. He's not that good looking. He, he, like, like he created everything. And people are like, mm, not impressed. He's not insulted. Because he sees from a different perspective. And he's humble and the word is in him and he's living it out. And that's what we get to do together. We hear a teaching like quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And I'm like, oh, that's not good news. My heart could think that. This is incredibly good news because it actually leads to our freedom and it leads to blessing. And, and blessing is happy. Like when, when we live this out, this idea, we are happier than, hey, you know what? I'm not gonna let you talk and I am gonna talk and I am gonna be angry. No one's happy like that. No one I know. People are happy that I know that many of you in this room that are like, you know what? I'm gonna choose to share God's love with people and I'm gonna do it the way that Jesus did it. Or I'm gonna try my best to do it the way that Jesus did it. And he did it with compassion and gentleness and humility. He nailed grace and truth. He was exceptional. At one church, one of the things we want to do every day is we want everybody to be in the game. And, and meaning everyone to receive the love of God every day and for each of us to share the love of God every day. And a primary way we share the love of God is by speaking peacefully where God has placed us. Pray for one goes like this. It says, God, would you please give me one person to share your love with today? Uh, I would love to pray that together. You can pray it out loud. You can pray it in your gut, however you typically pray. But would you pray that prayer with me? God, would you please give me one person to share your love with? I love it. So we get to step up and then we step down and then we get to step out. So we step up. We experience God, we step down and we've been humbled by this and, and now we step out to do what God truly desires us to do. So James, again, chapter one, verse 26, says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. This, I mean, this kind of, that hits. Verse 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So James tells us what religion is and what religion is not. And he says what religion is not because I'm so tempted to think that's what religion is. I'm right, everybody else is wrong. I'm gonna tell them why I'm right and they're wrong and I'm gonna fight and I think to fight I gotta be angry and I think to fight I gotta be aggressive and I need to win this for God. And so many people throughout history have taken that approach to trying to share good news with people that Jesus loves him and died on a cross for them in a not good news delivery. So what religion is not is anger 
What religion is not is uh, when I can't control my mouth. Because if I can't control my mouth, it means I can't control my heart or that I'm wrestling with allowing God to control my heart. What true religion is, is caring for widows and orphans in their distress. And what James is communicating is religion is helping people that can't help themselves. Religion is helping people that can't say, all right, you help me, now I'm going to help you back. Religion is doing things for people that can't get even. Religion is doing things where it might be just a thank you, and it might not even be a thank you, but our creator and father in heaven is like, you're doing exactly what I have for you to do. True religion is when I realize that I am an orphan and I am a widow and God, I'm bringing nothing to the table other than I'm a recipient of love that couldn't earn it, couldn't deserve it, couldn't achieve it. I got nothing. Religion typically sounds like this. I'm gonna climb a ladder and as I'm good, God is going to love me. And if I act better than you, God will love me more than you. Or if I act worse than you, God won't love me as much as you. Religion that we're talking about as beautiful and Jesus-centered has nothing to do with a ladder. I'm not trying to get to God. God came to us. God came to us. That's it. That's it. God came to us and he was humble and he was kind and he was gentle and he was invitational. And now he's asking us to go to others filled with his love. We have, we have this communion cup which is really like the climax of our, of our worship service. We, we hold this and we think about what Jesus has done on the cross for us that's symbolized in this. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, it was a holiday. He was having a holiday meal with his friends and he took bread and he broke it. He passed it around the table and he said, this bread represents my body and I'm giving it for you. And there's no way they could comprehend that Jesus was trying to paint the picture like very shortly I'm gonna be on a cross. Very shortly everything is gonna hit the fan but I'm giving myself for you and this is my act of love for you. Today, I want to tell you that Jesus loves us and he died for us and he made us perfect on the cross and because of what he's done on our behalf, we are empowered to have peace and to have conversations full of peace. Jesus is out to bring peace to us and the people around us. And this reminds us of that. So again, this bread represents Jesus' body. He's given it on our behalf. If we are saying yes to Jesus, would you please take this with me? That same night, uh, Jesus took a cup and he proposed a toast. And he, and he said, the contents of this cup represents my blood and my blood is gonna be poured out to wash away the sins of the world. That anyone who trusts in Jesus and what he accomplished on our behalf has eternal life. Anyone who has trusted him to forgive our sin has eternal life. I'm touching this because I can't even do this I, I, I can't always listen and I am quick to speak sometimes and I'm quick to anger at times and, and I realize and then how thankful I am that I have a savior. If you would like Jesus to lead your life, 
to forgive your sin, to fill you with peace, please ask him to be that. Ask him to lead. Ask him to forgive and give your life to him. He loves you and he's for you and he says yes to you. So if we are saying yes to him, would you take this with me? Love it. Uh, we're going to continue to worship. If there's anyone here that would like prayer, we're going to have someone praying right under the screen to my right. So it could be you have a challenge. It could be you have uh, a, something to celebrate. Sometimes it's just really nice having someone put a hand on our shoulder and pray a blessing. So, so that is available. To my left, if anyone is here, You've trusted Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, but you have not been baptized in water. We would love to invite you to do that. Baptism symbolizes that we have gone all in in our faith with Jesus. We have water, we have towels, we have t-shirts. Mike and Ron are over here and they would love to connect with you. So that invitation is open. Our last invitation is if anyone would like to be more involved, this is the best way to communicate that. If you'd like to be in a group, you can check that box, we'll follow up with you. If you'd like to volunteer, you can check that box, we'll follow up with you. God is doing something here. And we would love, to be, we would love for you to be a part of it. If you would like prayer, you can go up here or you can write in that box how we can be praying for you. And this week, our staff and our elders will be praying and asking God to meet you in whatever you need. So just know that is there. You can take that. You can fold it in half a couple times. There is a box in the back of the room between the exits. You can place it in there. I'd love to pray for us. Would you join me in prayer, please? God, we know uh, this is a lot. Let our hearts desire it. Let us, let us really want to connect with you and live this thing out. God, we need your help. We need your spirit. Please meet us in our need. If our life is in pieces, God, I pray that you would bring peace. God, that you would do the miraculous, that you would do the unbelievable that you would do what only you can do. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.